And I bid you all grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is great to be with you Friday, March the 12th, year of our Lord 2021, as we take one more look at one of the readings from last Sunday, the third Sunday in the season of Lent. Uh, this time we're taking a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. And actually, this time it's easy to see why this particular uh, reading got matched with the gospel for last week. If you remember uh, the gospel last week, Jesus goes up to the temple. It's the beginning of his public ministry. Uh, he finds the animal sellers there, the money changers there, chases them all out. The authorities come to him and say, hey, what sign do you show? What divine miracle do you show that you have the authority to go ahead and tell all these people to get out of here? Now, did Jesus need a miraculous sign? The answer is no. God's word, as we talked about yesterday a little bit with the Ten Commandments, God's word should have clearly made it apparent that taking sacred space where his word was to be heard, where people were to be gathered for worship, taking that space and using it to make money and sell and trade things and stuff like that, that should have been right out. So there wasn't a need for a miraculous sign. The word itself already says that that should have been right out. But the authorities want some sort of concrete miracle. And, and in our passage from 1 Corinthians, Paul notes that the nature of the Judaism of that first century is it demanded some sort of concrete miraculous proof of the authority of what was being preached Otherwise, it wouldn't give ear to it. So that there's that. And then the second thing is when Jesus tells the authorities what the sign is, he says, hey, tear down this temple, referring to his body, and I'll raise it up in three days. They scoff at him as being foolish, right? And we understand that the tearing down the temple, rebuilding in three days is a reference to his death and resurrection. And what is it that these authorities find foolish? The idea that one of God's chosen representatives would suffer and die and then be raised. The, that did not seem to be to them part of the program of God's saving work. So you've got the demand for a sign, the foolishness of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and Paul makes reference to both of those in this passage from 1 Corinthians. So we're in the first letter to the Corinthians, reading New King James, uh, and we pick up at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, According to the world, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So a lot going on in that passage. I could be here all day if I were to try and do a complete unpacking. But what I love about this passage is we start out with the message of, of the cross, right? The, and, and the message of the cross is not just about Jesus crucified. It's saying that salvation by grace is found through faith in Jesus' sacrificial death. That when you look at God offering him for the salvation of the world, you trust in that as the source of mercy, you trust in that as the source of forgiveness, you trust in that as the source of new life. And I would say that not only was it foolishness back in the first century, 
the idea that one man's death would save the whole world, but a lot of people still regard it as foolishness today. Um, if you have discussions, not only amongst some modern Christians, but also with those outside the church, there are a lot of people who say, how can one guy dying 2,000 years ago be the source of salvation for everyone, right? Uh, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to worldly wisdom. It's still regarded as, as foolishness, and some people would even say, um, a kind of perverse foolishness, right? I've had discussions with folks who will say that, you know, uh, God offering up the innocent son to suffer and die is a kind of abusive injustice, and, and how could you found a religion on that? So, uh, again, these words are very contemporary. Paul is not, uh, you know, sort of exaggerating here. The, uh, the, the message of the cross really is foolishness to those who are perishing, and perishing he means uh, those who are, who are in unbelief, those who are in denial of God, those who are following the ways of this world, which are ultimately the ways of death. On the other hand, us who are being saved by faith, right, those of us who are trusting in God's grace and mercy through Jesus Christ, we recognize the cross is actually the power of God. It's not foolishness, but here is the fullness of God's glory and might and love poured out that God himself in the flesh of Jesus makes that offering willingly for us. This is, this is God's power and love, right? Um, so uh, Paul says, you know, where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the disputer? Um, God has made foolish the wisdom of the world uh, because through wisdom, and this is human wisdom, the world doesn't know God. Now, again, in human philosophical wisdom, when you try to think about logic and uh, all the things that uh, the, the, those who are just thinking from human speculation standpoint can achieve, right, the most that humans can achieve on their own with logic and empirical evidence and lots of arguments is they might be able to figure out that there is some sort of creator, right? If you've uh, uh, followed debates around creationism versus evolution and the origins of the universe and stuff like that, you know that there is um, the um, theory out there uh, uh, done by secularists, not people who are necessarily interested in Christianity, that they, uh, they, they believe that the universe shows evidence of having been designed, that it's not just a random amalgam of things, but it looks like it has come together in very specific ways to accomplish a very specific purpose. And so the old argument of design is, if it looks like it's designed for a purpose, it has to have a designer. So some people would say you can, you can get that much from logic and from empirical evidence. Now, I'm not gonna enter that debate. Irrespective of what Paul points out is human wisdom can get you to some sort of designer, but it can't get you a relationship with him. It can't get you knowledge of who he is, what his attitude towards you is, whether it's even a he, right? It could be a she, it could be not a she or a he, right? The, 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 this creator may be beyond our understanding of what gender is. So, right, human wisdom doesn't allow us from our end to enter into a relationship with God. God has to reveal himself to us. God has to come to us and say, hi, here I am, and, and here's who I am, and here's how I am disposed toward you and what I will do for you. So uh, human wisdom does not get us to God. God has to reveal himself to us. And, and then we go on, right? Uh, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message that we proclaim, right? And the message that we proclaim is not only of the cross, not only of Jesus' death and resurrection, but that message then brings Christ to us, right? It is the preaching of the word that gives us the Holy Spirit. It's the preaching of the word that uncovers God to us, that we know God loves, that we know God forgives, that we know God is gracious. We know that God gives us his Holy Spirit. We know that God wants us reconciled. We know that God wants us to walk in the light, right? There's all sorts of things that the proclamation gives to us that we couldn't discover on our own. And God wants us to hear that word and, and embrace that word. So we, uh, we have that. So the, uh, the word is, is the wisdom of God and it is the power of God. Now, again, some folks will demand science. They want to see miracles. Some folks will demand human logical. It all makes good sense according to our standards of what makes good sense. And God says, we're just not going to get out of that. Um, you don't get science. You don't get satisfying logic. Um, you get the message of the cross. On the other hand, there are people who get gripped by the message, right? When God comes to them, when they learn of who God is, when they get a sense of God's disposition toward them and the reality of God's presence, doesn't matter whether they were Jews or Greeks, whether they were demanding miraculous signs or wanted human wisdom, suddenly they are satisfied with the good news and the work and the grace of God that has brought them this new life. Now, Paul goes on, 
a little bit of irony when he says, you know, look at yourselves uh, to the Corinthian congregation. He says, look, you know, there's not a whole lot of you in that congregation who are humanly wise. Not a lot of you are professors at the university. And not a lot of you are noble, right? There's not a lot of movers and shakers in the congregation. You don't got a lot of doctors and lawyers and uh, mighty uh, folks in, in society, right? And he says, when you look at yourselves, you see that you're kind of a bit of a ragtag bunch. On the other hand, God has chosen the foolish, God has chosen the weak, God has chosen the ragtag to show that he is a God who cares for everyone. He is not a God of partiality. He doesn't only care about those who are rich or those who are mighty or those who are this, that, or the other thing. He wants everyone, and he's chosen these things to show that all the stuff that the world cares about is nothing. Right? This is so no one can boast before the Lord. And I think, you know, this is the remarkable liberating thing for those of us who are in the church, right? Is that we don't have to worry about whether or not we've proven ourselves. We don't have to worry about whether we've accomplished enough. We don't have to worry about whether or not anyone respects us out in the world when we walk out on the street. Because we know that God has graciously redeemed us in Christ. That's the reason the, the, the cross and Christ, they're the wisdom and redemption and sanctification and justification for us. We recognize all of that is what God has done, and we simply live in light of that wondrous mercy and then try to share that with others and, and try to walk by that light and let our lives be shaped by it. Well, that's enough for 1 Corinthians. Let's get to the litany, and then we'll be done. Uh, this Sunday will now be the fourth uh, Sunday in the Lenten season. Uh, we're in person, advance over last year, and we'll be hearing uh, the famous John 3.16 passage from the Gospel, God so loved the world, but you can catch that on Sunday, and then next week we'll talk about the other reading. So, let's go do the litany. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, good Lord, deliver us. From the crafts and assaults of the devil and from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver us. From pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and rebellion, good Lord, deliver us. From lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death, good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, help us, good Lord. By your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, help us, good Lord. By your glorious resurrection and ascension, by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment, help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, O Lord, to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. To put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. To beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. To raise those who fall, and to strengthen those who stand, to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. To give to all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, we implore you to hear us, good Lord, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, we implore you to hear us, good Lord, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage and have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. O Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy. O Christ, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. O Christ, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. 
O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. All right, blessings to you all. We'll look forward to catching you next week. Until then, God go with you.